Hi guys and welcome back to the channel. We've got an exciting new video today because for the last few weeks I've been able to use the new Nikon Z9 with the new 100 to 400 millimeter lens extensively in the field and I also tested it with both of the new Nikon extenders to see whether that might be an option to extend the reach of this lens even further. At this stage I also have to thank all my friends who are willing to lend me their Nikon gear so I could make that video for you and test the gear in the field myself. So Nikon coming out with this new 100 to 400 millimeter lens and a nice and lightweight package is an intriguing offering. It does come at a relatively high price point. So let's go ahead and find out how it performs in the field, especially when it comes to action photography. The 100 to 400 comes in at a very nice and lightweight 1.4 kilos or 2.7 pounds. It has a lot of programmable custom function buttons on the lens, which are great because for instance, you can put different autofocus modes on these. It also has a menu focus ring and this control ring at the back where you can put different things like ISO, aperture or shutter speed. The 100 to 400 obviously also comes with a lens sort that is easily slides on and clicks into place so you can't lose it and I would always recommend to use lens suits because they stop stray light to get into your images and also just protects the front element a little bit. It's also an external zoom design so the lens will extend outwards if you're zooming to 400 millimeters. There are no VR buttons on the lens at all. All the VR settings are changed in the camera and it has a 77 millimeter filter mount, which is great because that's one of the most common. The minimum focusing distance of this lens is also fantastic with just 75 centimeters or 29 inches. So you can get really nice and close to like an insect or flower, for instance. Let's talk about the autofocus because that's where the lens performed very well. The autofocus tracked well, was accurate and gave me a lot of nice and sharp images. And even with the extenders, it still performed at a very high and fast level. Autofocus is probably more camera related than it is lens related. I would think that the lens will perform better on the Z9 than on Nikon's other cameras when it comes to speed, accuracy and tracking ability. Let's talk about the Z9's autofocus for a little bit because overall it's very good and I've been getting some fantastic results. However, to get the most out of the camera, I have to use a mix of three different autofocusing methods that I have to apply in different situations. And that actually makes it harder for me to get the images in the field because it just slows me down when I constantly have to think about in my head, do I need to use mode one, two or three? So while I've been getting good results, I really wish that in the future Nikon will have one mode that works for the majority of the time. So you don't have to have three or four different buttons with different autofocusing methods to get the best results. The first mode that I like the most for perch birds is the 3D tracking where I have an initial autofocusing point. I put that on the bird and then once I focus on it, the camera will stay on the bird and track it all over my viewfinder. That mode works quite good for perch birds or like a swimming bird with a clean background. Where it didn't work very well for me was when it comes to birds in flight and action photography. Oftentimes it would struggle to find the bird or very quickly jump off the bird again onto the background or tree or the water. The next mode I'd tried is the AF area where the camera just randomly selects the subject for you all over the viewfinder and then tracks it all over the viewfinder. That was the most disappointing for me because I really wanted that mode to work the best because it would be the easiest to use. But in reality, that mode unfortunately didn't perform very well. The last mode that I found the most reliable is the wide area large with tracking. When it comes to action photography, I've gotten by far the best results when using that mode. So there I have a little red box and I have to put that box on the bird and then it starts tracking within the box and I have to try and keep that box on the bird. It will track outside the box as well, but only to a certain degree. At some stage it will let go and then will lose focus if the bird flew too far out of the box. Overall, I've definitely gotten the best and most consistent results with that. Let me show you a few examples now why I find it so confusing to find the right mode in the field. This first example, we have the mask lapwing standing at the edge of a little lake. And naturally I would think the 3D tracking would do a very good job here. So I put that on the bird's head, engage it. But as you can see, it actually doesn't work in this case. It jumps on the background, jumps on the bird's back, jumps back and forth. It just doesn't track the bird very well. So I'm trying the wide area large. And to my surprise, the wide area large finds the head pretty well and tracks the lapwing in this situation. 
On to the next example, we have a bar shoulder dove sitting in the tree. I'm trying the wide area large first and it just can't find the bird. I focus on the bird, but it never engages the tracking. So now in this case, I can't recompose my image at all because the wide area large hasn't engaged your tracking and it hasn't latched onto the bird. So if I move the rectangle off the bird now, it will lose focus. Tried the 3D tracking and in this scenario, the 3D tracking worked well because I could put that on the bird and then it would stick to the bird and find the bird. And that's exactly what makes it so difficult to pick the one go-to mode that you want to use most of the time. It would be really great if Nikon worked on having one mode that merges the 3D tracking with the wide area large and gives me tracking that is reliable and works all over the frame. Don't get me wrong, I've been getting some amazing images and you will see them soon, but that's just one of the frustrations that I had in the field. So let me just share how I've set up the Z9 at the moment. I have the wide area large on the AF on button. That's the button I use the most. I have the 3D tracking on the function button one at the front of the camera. I also have it on the lens function button number one that I can press in the field and it will also start the 3D tracking. So it's pretty easily available to me. And then I have the normal autofocus on the function button number two on the front of the camera. So this setup has worked pretty well for me and allows me to quickly switch between all the different modes. Let's talk about something that really positively surprised me about the Z9 and the 100 to 400, and that is how well the IBIS and the VR work together. You can handhold relatively low shutter speeds and get amazing stable handhold video. And video is really where I was almost shocked when I saw how stable and steady the VR makes your scene, almost like you're on a tripod. There's just one little nitpick that I have. And from time to time, the VR or the IBIS, I'm not sure what it is, creates a little sort of robotic jerk in your footage. So you're holding it, it's very stable, and suddenly there's like a little jump. But that's something I'm hoping Nikon might be able to fix with a firmware update because other than that, the stabilization is truly amazing and much better than anything else that I've used. So after all this talk, I'm sure you're keen to check out some sample images. So let's jump right in. So the first image we want to look at is this beautiful, stunning looking rainbow lorikeet with a nice and bright background shot wide open at f5.6. We see some great sharpness, great colors, and beautiful feather detail. I noticed that a reef egret had flown in right below my feet. So I was able to sneak down and get some of these images. You can see the sharpness is really nice. Here's a nice shot where it just come up on one of the rocks. And then here's probably my favorite image for the session. There's the raw file. And here's the final edited image. And I edited that with the workflow that I teach in my masterclass. The one thing I noticed is that in fast on image view, the files look very good. But if we go into Photoshop, you can see that with the Adobe profiles, the colors look kind of weird. And this is why Glenn and I actually created our Pro sets a while back that worked very well on the R5 because the R5 had the same issue. All the Adobe profiles just didn't work very well. So let me show you what our Pro sets can do in just one click. If I go to my favorite one, Vibrant More Contrast, I can transform this gray and dull image into a pretty nice looking image. So I just need to make it a little bit brighter, give it a little bit of warmth, Get a little, little bit of vibrance. And within a couple clicks, literally one click, I go from a dull gray image to a beautiful vibrant blue image. So if you want to transform your raw editing as well with just one click, make sure to check out our process that give you a great starting point with many different camera models. Another great bird that lives around you is the bush stone curlew. And for some reason, there's one car park where they like to hang out the most and you can actually get some cool images of them. So here's the first image with this really nice color transition in the background. If I crop that to a nice vertical image, that will look really nice. And when we zoom into that, it has some great sharpness at 400 millimeters before sunrise and overall beautiful details and just some colors that I really loved. After that, I moved around a little bit, got some different background with a bit of blue and some of the grass behind the bird. And this also is very nice and sharp and it was still pretty dark. So it's shot at high ISO, but the image quality is very nice. I know you guys always want to see some really nice and high ISO examples. So I took the lens and the Z9 to the deep dark rainforest and found a pretty elusive bird, the Eastern Whitbird. And it was extremely dark, it was 12,800 ISO, like a hundredth of a second, handheld, wide open, so 
very challenging conditions and the camera lens performed well, but it was a struggle. At times it would just not find the bird, focus on the background, go past the bird, would not find the eye. But with any other camera that I've taken to this setting, I also had these struggles. So nothing unusual, but keep in mind if you're shooting in very low light, the performance of the autofocus will definitely drop a lot. The other thing I had to do to get the best images at high ISO is to shoot in a lossless compression format. Because currently DX or Puro that I use to denoise my images is not supporting the high efficiency RAW format. And without the DX or Pure RAW, it was much harder for me to get the noise out of the images. I still made it work, but it was a lot more work. And at times I really struggled to get it out because then I could only use Telpa's denoise. And sometimes that just would leave weird artifacts in the background. So the best workflow I found was lossless compression, DX or Puro. And if there was still noise in the file, then I ran Telpa's denoise in Photoshop and I got some fantastic results. I will also make a separate video on noise reduction very soon. So make sure to subscribe to the channel to not miss that video because I will teach you some very valuable insights in that video. So when we look at this image, we can see that the image quality has definitely suffered, but considering the conditions, I think it's still pretty good. It's a little bit less sharp, quite noisy at ISO 12,800, but nothing that we couldn't clean up. And then here's another image where the bird came really close to us and I was able to get this nice headshot also pretty noisy you can see some nice details still but not as sharp as you would get the shot in nice light so this file actually shot in the high efficiency raw format which is a problem because i couldn't run it through dx or pure RAW, which meant that i had to use topaz denoise and whatever else i had to get rid of the noise because i couldn't use dx or pure RAW. so that made it harder and my way to work with this file was to open adobe camera raw and then apply a little bit of noise reduction there so Topaz didn't have to do as big of a job. And also when I added the sharpening in camera raw, I masked out the background so that the sharpening was only applied to the bird. So if we compare this dark gray blue image with a lot of noise and then flick through the image where I applied the denoise and my process, I think that's already quite a dramatic improvement. And then I took it one step further and edited the whole file for you. Here you can see the raw file after I applied the process. And then here my final edited image where I gone through all the steps that I teach you in my masterclass. One of the mornings I was getting ready to take the shot. Then this dog came running right at me, scared all the birds away. So I was pretty annoyed, but then I thought, Oh well, let's see how the Z9 tracks the dog. It did really well. I took 88 images. Every single shot of these is basically nice and sharp. So it never lost track and it definitely gave me some really nice images. It was an interesting exercise because it just tracked it so well. It's obviously a nice target because it's so dark against that background. So overall the results I was getting with the Z9 and the 100 to 400 were fantastic. Like there's no complaints there at all. Great sharpness, great image quality, good noise performance, all you want from a good combo basically. So let's talk about the biggest flaws or issues I found with the setup that I was using. And both of these are actually not really the lenses fault. The first one is that in combination with the Z9, this setup is just so much heavier than like a similar setup with a Sony A1 or Canon R5, like R500 to 500 or A100 to 400 are just significantly lighter. The Nikon lens itself is super light, amazingly lightweight and lighter than the competition. But the Z9 is a real heavy beast. Not really a problem and I know eventually Nikon will have a lot more mirrorless cameras, also lighter mirrorless cameras. But it's just something that I noticed using it side by side with some lighter setups. And the other issue is that 400 millimeters is just not very long for wildlife photography. Especially when it comes to smaller birds, 400 millimeter usually gives you pretty small bird in the frame, just like that bar shoulder duff there behind me. So now you might say, if it's too short, does it work with these extenders? Can I simply put a teleconverter on and transform the lens with the 1.4 into 140 to 560 millimeter lens and with the two times extender into 200 to 800 millimeter lens? Because in theory, that sounds like the perfect solution. You have these two little things and give yourself much more reach. But 
in real life, this is not actually that easy because there's a few big drawbacks when you're using extenders. The first one is the loss of light. So with the 1.4 extender, the lens is along the long end, an f8 560mm lens. And with the 2x extender, it becomes an f11 800mm lens. The other issues typically with using extenders on zoom lenses is a loss of image quality and also a slight decrease in accuracy and speed of the autofocus. So let's jump right in and see whether extenders are worth the money because these things cost five, six, seven hundred dollars, I think over a thousand dollars in Australia. And so if you spend that kind of money, you definitely want to get some good results. The first image is one of the car park curlies on a dark late afternoon at relatively high ISO with the 1.4 extender shot wide open at f8. Overall, considering the conditions, this result is pretty good. This is the before, and then this is with pro set and noise reduction. And I think the file comes up really well and we get some nice detail and sharpness. Not as sharp as the lens without an extender, but I think this is a more than acceptable result in some pretty dark light wide open with an extender. I'm talking about wide open because with all extenders, you should usually stop down at least one stop. So when we look at an image at f11 in some better light, we will see that the image quality is actually pretty amazing and I'd say it's almost as good as the bare lens. I know there's people out there that say don't use extenders on zoom lenses. I've said that in the past as well but on these super expensive really high-end zoom lenses you can definitely use at least the 1.4 extender very well and I think these results are more than good so I wouldn't have a concern using the 1.4 extender on the 100 to 400 even in low light I got some pretty good results and lastly I want to show you an image of this bar shoulder dove anything that's very close to the camera will always have better image quality than something that's a bit further away so here we have 560 millimeters wide open at f8 and if we zoom into that we see I'd say acceptable sharpness it's not as sharp as the headshots anymore it's pretty noisy but if I clean up this file I would still get an acceptable result out of that when it comes to this two times extender it's not a clear picture anymore the 1.4 works really well the two times extender works well at times but at other times it also did a pretty poor job so you definitely need a good light and if you stop down to f13 for instance you also get much better image quality you would also notice that the camera struggled a lot more to find the bird at times the autofocus felt a little bit slower and less accurate so there was a lot more difference between each of the files like with the no extender or with the 1.4 extender basically all the files were sharp with with the two times extender there was definitely a drop off but let me show you here we have a mask lap wing with a beautiful sunlit background and if we zoom into that you can see that wide open at f11 the sharpness is acceptable but it's not really something you get excited about but as an emergency option and cleaning this file up a bit and sharpening it i think it could still deliver you a pretty good final result here's another image of a galah that i shot at 680 millimeters so zoomed back a little bit keep in mind that if i zoom out a little bit the lens definitely gets sharper if we zoom into that we see not an amazing image quality but also not a terrible image quality you let me know in the comments do you think the two times extender is worth it considering that it's also very expensive or is that image quality already a little bit kind of iffy for you I think for someone like a birder, this could still be a fantastic option if you're mainly after getting the birds larger in the frame and you don't care about the last 10% of image quality, I think you can still get some good images with the two times extender as well. I wanna show you another thing that's important to keep in mind because you might start to think, if I can put a two times extender on 100 to 400 and get a decent result, maybe I don't need any prime lens anymore or what's the point in using a prime lens? And the main difference is the background. At 800 millimeters, you can see the background is quite busy. And here's the same purge shot with my 600 millimeter prime lens. And you can see a huge difference between the backgrounds. The 600 millimeter prime lens just makes any background look smooth, even if it's pretty close to the bird. And that's something all of these zoom lenses, whether that's 100 to 400, 100 to 500, 150 to 600, 200 to 600, they just can't do what a prime lens can do when it comes to having smooth backgrounds. I really wanted to know, can I get great images out of the two times extender? So I looked for curly and good light, used low ISO, 
stop down to F13. Let's see what happened. And I think that's pretty great image quality now in good light, stop down with a little bit of extra sharpening. I think you wouldn't even be able to tell that I didn't use the lens without any extenders. So in great light, stop down, both of these extenders did a pretty good job. But the two times extender in particular here is a little bit more of a mix back. If it works well in good light, like on this curl, you get some amazing results. But on average, you can see clear downgrade in image quality and autofocus accuracy when you're using the two times extender. The 1.4 extender, on the other hand, did a truly amazing job even for action photography. So now I've made you wait so long to see your favorite part, the birds in flight and action photography. But as we all know, we should always save the best for last. Because when it comes to the action photography, small birds in flight with busy backgrounds, I got some great results with the Z9 100 to 400 and the 1.4 extender. Even though the Z9 and 100 to 400 combo would never manage to track the bird for like the whole time. Typically it would get it for takeoff, track it for a bit and then lose it. And sometimes I would reacquire focus and other times I would just lose it completely. I got some great results nevertheless, but the key for me was actually in the field to reacquire focus after losing it. So I used relatively high ISO, high shutter speed, and then wide open at F8. Typically, I would pre-focus on the bird, have to focus engage, so the tracking is engaged. So whenever the bird takes off, I start just firing away at 20 frames per second and try to keep track of the bird. Here's one of the series of images that you just saw live in my viewfinder. And you can see that it tracked the bird quite well. It stayed on it with good sharpness, even against this busy background still sharp but then once the bird got a little bit out of the center of the frame it started to struggle a little bit more and then it got really distracted once these big leaf plants started to come into the frame and then it got especially distracted by this branch down here obviously that's a bit more in the center of the frame and then it just lost focus completely onto these branches down here and the bird was completely out of focus. So let me show you my two favorite images now that I've taken with the Z9 of these bar shoulder doves in flight. And this is something I would have never attempted with the DSLR camera because I think they would have just failed miserably. So having the tracking, even with its challenges, has worked very well. And both of these shots are actually got after the camera lost focus. I stopped tracking the bird and then refocused while it was flying away from me. And got the bird again in focus. So this method would actually working pretty well for me. This is the first image of this bar shoulder dove just flying past me against a relatively busy background, but not too busy at 560 millimeters wide open at F8. And then I got this amazing image. I was also again focused on the bird on the branch. It took off, the camera lost the focus. I refocused and I got a few more images, including this one. So this is the raw file. Then I applied my pro set and tweaked it a little bit. And then here you can see the final step image where I apply it all my steps that I teach you in my masterclass where you can learn step by step how to edit your images, how to use curves, layers, do cloning, all those things that will make you better bird photographers. So if you're interested in that, make sure to check out my masterclass down there in the description. What I haven't really talked about yet is the Z9's ability to take amazing video in 4K, 8K, slow motion, and also to record in ProRes video format, which is nice and easy to edit. Especially with the 100 to 400, the Z9 is really, really lethal combo and you can get some fantastic footage handheld. I said earlier about image stabilization that the VR does these little robotic jerks and this can be a pain in video if it happens at the wrong time. Overall, the VR with the IBIS is the most stable that I've ever used. You could also do video very well with both of these extenders and the footage would also be super stable, still nice and sharp. So no complaints there at all. The only thing is that with the two times extender, you definitely notice that the autofocus is a little bit slower and that the footage is just not as stable as no extender or the 1.4 extender, but definitely the two times extender I'd say is still usable for video. Where the Nikon really shines is with the eye tracking in video mode. Sony doesn't have it at all. 
Canon has it and it works quite well, but on the Z9, I'd say it works the best. It's very good. It finds the eye relatively fast. The only time it really struggles is when the bird's completely out of focus. Then I usually have to use manual mode to manual autofocus to get it onto the bird and then the tracking will take over. What's also really great and something Canon doesn't have at all is that you can select very easily which eye of the bird you want to focus on because there will be two boxes with a little arrow and you can use the joystick on the back of the Z9 to actually select which eye you would want the camera to focus on of this two birds in your frame, it will often allow you to select which eye of each bird you want to focus on. So that's something that's really cool, very well done. And overall in video mode, this is where the camera and lens has probably surprised me the most because it's stunning looking footage, great dynamic range, great at high ISO and super stable except for the little jerk. So really amazing combo when it comes to taking video. All in all, this is a lens I know a lot of Nikon shooters will be very happy with. It's not cheap at around 2700 US dollars and a lot more in most other countries, but it definitely backs up the price with stellar performance in the field. In the future, if the Nikon 200 to 600 comes out and also delivers similar quality to this lens, a lot of people might feel like that getting to the 600 millimeter is better than only having the 400 millimeters. But at the same time, I think having the 100 millimeters all the way up to 400 millimeters and the ability to use extenders is more than good enough to justify having this lens. And it would be a fantastic secondary lens to like a 600 millimeter prime lens lens. And so all in all, a lens that has really impressed me. So I hope you guys enjoyed this thorough review. I had a lot of fun using the Z9 at 100 to 400 millimeter in the field and making this video. So please make sure to give me a thumbs up for the video. That helps me a lot with the algorithm. Let me know your thoughts in the comments about the Z9, the 100 to 400, how it performed in the field and with the extenders. Also make sure to subscribe to the channel and check out my Pro Sets and Masterclass down there in the description. And I will see you in my next video very soon. Bye guys.